So good evening, everybody, and welcome, as I said a moment ago, to our last webinar in the series for this year. And it's been amazing to see so many of you join us over the course of the year. I feel Florian's been our main host throughout with many tours around Africa and also one fantastic trip from Africa all the way to Brazil. Uh, we've also had Matt taking us around Oceania, Jazz taking us around the Indian Ocean, and even myself uh, talking through some of our luxury villas around the world. And a few weeks ago, you all quizzed me on just random travel facts and destinations, how we can travel, PCR testing, and just general COVID related questions. So I think it's fitting to really end the series on a fantastic presentation that Florian's put together. And it's a great presentation because it's a question that a lot of our guests asks our team. How do you choose the ideal safari destination? And that is going to be the theme of this evening. Now, for the, looking at the list of people who have attended, I know some of you, I know the names quite well, um, and I think you know us quite well. That's a, still a terrible picture, which I need to change at some point for of myself. Um, <laughs> but myself and Florian uh, will be your hosts tonight. Florian will be going through the presentation and I'll be coming back at the end uh, to answer any questions. So to set the scene for this evening, um, Florian will go through the presentation. At the bottom of the screen, as usual, you'll see that chat button. And please feel free at any time to add in some questions. And I will use those at the end to fire as many as I can at Florian with his wealth of knowledge of Africa and the destinations that we're featuring this evening. So just a little bit about uh, Hayes and Jarvis, as a lot of you um, already know us. Uh, so I think COVID has definitely given us the passion back for traveling. We've never lost that, but even more now that travel opens up. Uh, I think most of my team have now been away. I think it's just one person who hasn't. And they really wanted to get out and see the destinations again. They're absolute experts in their destinations. They wanted to see what's changed in some of them. You also probably know we're part of Travelopia, which is backed by KKR, uh, which has been fantastic to see us through the pandemic. And the last couple of months, we've been making so many bookings and we've got so many guests traveling with us and booked to depart over the next one, even two. And last week, Florian, I think you remember we made a trip to uh, 2024. And Sorry. that's fine, Sorry, Florian. Sorry, and, and, then, <laughs> and then, you know, what, what does it mean for you? I mean, we've spent so much time, energy, and indeed, some of our budget really investing in new experiences. We're seeing people want to tick off big bucket list destinations. We've really focused on our team. Our team have never been so well trained over this time. And the knowledge and expertise that they're gaining day on day, they're already very well traveled. Most of them on average have been with us for more than 10 to 15 years. We've also handpicked some more properties. And we keep doing this. And, and Florian's team are handpicking properties on a daily basis um, to try and add something new to our portfolio. And as ever, there's that book and travel with confidence. All of our guests can book knowing that their money's safe, it's protected. And if anything goes wrong with your trip and you can't travel, we'll give you money back, no questions asked. So from a destination point of view, you now where do we travel to? And this has changed slightly. We removed the Caribbean, which I've said uh, a few times before, just because it's hard to add value to just standard beach destinations. We've kept the Indian Ocean. Uh, because that twins really well with Africa, with Sri Lanka, India and the Middle East and a few other ones there for you to look at. But a couple of polls that will be coming up throughout the evening and the first couple will be coming up now. And the idea is, you know, what are you looking for? When, when are you looking to travel to? And this will help us in our marketing moving forward. So please feel free to uh, use the mouse and, and click the answers. If you're just still dreaming, that's absolutely fine as well. But we are seeing guests now looking for either quite short, sharp, want to get away in the next couple of months, or further afield. We've got guests booking for 2023 and beyond. Some people's honeymoons and weddings are much further afield. But it gives us and our partners a great opportunity to get some fantastic deals and make sure our marketing is correct for what you want. And the second question is, where are you looking at traveling to? What is on your bucket list? It's good to see Africa's winning this one, Florian. Uh, that helps for tonight's uh, mm. webinar. <laughs> but it's good to see a uh, good to see a real mix of destinations in there too. Yep, Africa's definitely won that one. Brilliant. And this will help us, as I say, just tell our marketing and our offerings as we move through, which will be 
January and February is our busiest time of the year from a, a booking perspective. Right, so without further ado, enough of me talking for now. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Florian, who's going to take you on a fantastic tour of Africa and really dive into how do you choose the ideal safari destination. As I said, use that chat button, make sure you're asking questions throughout, and I'll be back a bit later. But Florian, over to you. Thank you very much, James. And, and again, welcome from, uh, from Nairobi, from just the outskirts of, of Nairobi. And um, from this very special place, some of you may have joined on previous uh, webinars that we have been running. Um, so welcome from this very special place. Um, some of you may have recognized this fireplace, even if you haven't been on a, on a previous webinar, uh, because this is the fireplace that has been featured in many scenes of the movie Out of Africa. Um, this is the fireplace where Meryl Streep used to tell stories to Robert Redford in, in some of the very romantic scenes of Out of Africa. And this is the place that has been my home for the last 15 years. Um, so I made Africa my home and uh, yeah, really want to bring Africa to life for you uh, and that question, you know, how to choose the ideal safari destination. Some of you um, uh, may have been to Africa, some of you maybe not, you're thinking now, um, uh, want to go to Africa, but where? And you know, there's so many countries that you could go to, you see that here, you know, the uh, best, best known country, South Africa, uh, uh, Namibia, you know, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, the Southern African countries, and then you have, um, you know, the East African countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Malawi, somewhere in between. These are all safari destinations. These are all destinations where you can go on safari. And um, uh, many of you, especially haven't been on safari, probably ask, you know, where uh, uh, should I go? What's the best destination for me? And even if you've been on safari, you'd may ask yourself a similar question, which is where should I go next? And the answer to this really is, uh, it all depends on your interests and on your dreams. There is no ideal safari destination. Each of these countries has, uh, has different draws, different highlights that may appeal to you, but maybe not uh, to someone else. And uh, uh, really understanding that is, is, is helpful to choose uh, that place that really will excite you most. And we have structured this around the key interests and dreams that our guests mention over and over again in our conversations with them. And, and uh, over the last 15 years, we've been offering a uh, telemade uh, journeys to Africa. And um, you know, the, the number one uh, you know, interest and dream that comes up is, you know, I'd like to see as much wildlife as possible. I mean, 99% of our guests when they come to Africa, that's the main thing on their mind, but there are many others, you know, some have specific interests around, uh, you know, I want to see gorillas and chimpanzees. Uh, that is a specific area. Uh, some might say, I want to be active, not just sit in vehicles. I want to do walking safaris. So where can you do those? Some might say, you know, I love the water. I love lakes, rivers. I'd love to do water-based safaris. Where can I do those? Um, others might say, now, when I go to Africa, there's the Indian Ocean. It's a beautiful uh, water, but I'd like to combine safari and then relaxing at the beach. Uh, where can you do that? Um, some might say, I just, for me, the, the most beautiful experience is being in some spectacular landscapes. Where, where, where does Africa has that? Uh, where does Africa have that? Um, others might say, I also want to get a glimpse of life, everyday life in Africa. Nothing, uh, you know, staged, but really, uh, get a feeling for what, what, what life in Africa is like. Where can you experience that? And then others might be uh, more adventurous and say, yeah, I'd love to explore myself. I would like to rent a car and just go and explore Africa on my own. Um, so these are really uh, probably the most um, common uh, interests that, that our guests have articulated that you can actually link to countries. And that's really what I... I want to uh, do to you know go through these uh, through these interests, take, use them as a kind of structuring element, and while doing that, bring the different experiences, but also the different countries to life. And at the very end, we'll be wrapping it up uh, uh, so that you have a nice overview for which interest is which country the best suited. Uh, so hopefully, at the end of this, you have a much clearer view. Depending on your interest, maybe you probably already can see yourself where you fit in which country would, would be the one that, that suits you most, that will excite you most? And that's actually the question that I would like to ask you before I now start, you know, which of these 
uh, interests are the ones where you would find yourself most. I'll give you a moment just to, to give your vote and gives me a sense of, of uh, you know, where the interests, how are they divided? I'll just give you a moment. You see the poll in front of you. Um, please go ahead and just share which of these interests are really uh, yours. I'll just give you a moment. All right. Yeah, now the answers are coming in. Not surprisingly, well, let me not influence you. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, not surprisingly, what, what we of course hear most is, is, is as much wildlife as possible. Uh, but also, interesting, many of you uh, uh, enjoy landscape. So there's a mix. There's many others that, that, uh, uh, that you mentioned. Um, so let's go into those. So wildlife, not surprisingly, the number one draw that Africa has. So the question is really, I would like to see as much wildlife as possible. Where can I see this? And the answer really is, you can see incredible wildlife in all of the countries that I just mentioned. But I would single out really Kenya and Tanzania um, uh, as the place in Africa where if you just think I'll go to Africa once and I want to see as much wildlife as possible, either of these countries is, is the, the choice that I would recommend. And, you know, there are many uh, national parks there. Um, in Kenya, you have Amboseli, Samburu, the Masai Mara. I'll bring them to life to you in a moment. Um, um, and Gorongoro Crater and the Serengeti in, in Tanzania. Um, and there are many other places. Now, what makes Africa so, uh, East Africa, specifically Kenya and Tanzania so special and allows you to see particularly many animals is really what you see here. It's these open, endless grass savannas. Uh, and, and just picture yourself standing here, looking out and as far as the eye can see, you just see these endless rolling grass savannas. You see all the wildlife there, just like you see it on this picture. It's like a garden Eden. Here you, this is, uh, you know, wildebeest, there might be zebras, giraffe walking past, maybe you see elephants strolling in the background, uh, and, and many other animals. Uh, Southern Africa might have just as many animals, but it's harder to see them, because in Southern Africa, you would have what we'd call bush savanna. So picture that same, uh, you know, viewpoint, but you have lots of bushes and trees, you just not see as far as here in East Africa, and specifically in Kenya and Tanzania. So that's really just in terms of sheer number of animals, nothing really beats uh, Kenya and Tanzania. And just to bring alive some of those places that uh, would probably be highlights in those countries where you see particularly many animals is, you know, in Kenya, Amboseli is, you know, they like, here you have these iconic images of, uh, you know, elephants or giraffes in front of the highest peak of Africa, in front of Kilimanjaro, Parts of the year, there's hardly any snow left. It's just the glaciers there. This is probably the dry season. In the rainy season, or currently in the rainy season, you know, you have a lot more precipitation. There's a lot, a lot of that comes down as snow. And you see then that actually it will snow quite far down, but that snow often then uh, disappears. So great if you want to just enjoy and, um, uh, you know, have a look at Kilimanjaro and see the animals. But also, of course, great if, you, if you're a mountaineer and actually want to a scale the highest peak of Africa, which I was lucky enough to do about, I think, uh, 18 years ago. Uh, another place that complements really nicely with, uh, with Amboseli is in Northern Kenya, Samburu, also known for its animals, uh, sorry, for its, um, for its elephants, also for some unusual species um, uh, like wild dogs, very different landscapes than Amboseli, uh, you know, much harsher, a drier savanna. And then really the, the jewel of Kenya is the Maasai Mara. If, if, if you've been to Kenya, uh, I'm, uh, you probably have been to the Maasai Mara. Um, it's really, uh, for me, together with the Serengeti and with uh, a third park, uh, South Luangwa in Zambia, that would be my personal three uh, top uh, highlights in Africa. One of them, the Maasai Mara, uh, luckily only about four hour drive from, from this house. Um, so I go there, I try to go there couple of times each, each year and, 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 and the wildlife sightings are incredible. You know, you have, this is when the uh, migration is on, but they are, uh, we talk about the migration in a moment, you have everything, you have the lions, we just saw the, the cheetah, you have the leopards in the trees, you have the uh, elephants, um, you know, large elephants, you know, tiny little elephants. Uh, the only uh, uh, one of the, the famous big five 
that you're less likely to see in the Maasai Mara are the rhinos. Uh, if you want to see the rhinos, then you'd actually com combine it with a with probably an uh, uh, Lycopia, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, it comes up in different contexts. So you can see the big five in Kenya, um, um, and and uh, it's an all year round destination. And so is Tanzania. Um, it's wonderful all year round. You have you know one of the main draws is this incredible Ngorongoro crater. Uh, you know a 21 mile uh, a crater which just teems with wildlife and you just it's very open and uh, you know if you're at this place where with pictures taken you literally can see in all directions and you see everything it feels like a garden eden you know here the uh, the the zebra the the wildebeest and you know the you know everything you will see everything the the lions in the distance the hyena walking past uh, it feels like a garden eden if you're there and then of course you can combine that with the Serengeti, which is really the same ecosystem as the Maasai Mara, just divided by, by humans. And, and I wanna talk a little bit more about the Maasai Mara and the Serengeti and specifically this incredible unique phenomenon of the great migration, which uh, many of you probably have heard of, even if you haven't, about the pictures that I'll show you, you will probably say, yes, I've seen that on television. The phenomenon is, is, is explained by the fact that there are uh, one and a half million a wildebeest and zebra, no one really knows exactly how many, one and a half million is an estimate that basically move following the rains and they have to because there are so many, wherever they are, they will finish the grass, they will eat the grass. So at some point they have to move on and they essentially follow the rains, they follow the fresh grass. And the a pattern of movement uh, is quite predictable. Um, it starts you know, January, February, March in the Southern Serengeti here in Tanzania. Um, uh, where hundreds of thousands of young ones are born. You can just imagine what kind of buffet that is, buffet feast for the predators, for the lions, for the leopards, for the hyena. They will all be there. It's an incredible sight, the endless open plains of the Southern Serengeti. Animals then move on April, May into the Central Serengeti, which is great uh, all year round for wildlife, but specifically April, May, uh, there's a lot of wildlife there. Then they move on May, June into the Western Serengeti, they, they, they meet the first main obstacle, the Grumeti River, uh, which is steaming with large crocodiles. And then they continue into the Northern Serengeti. And this is when they cross into the Maasai Mara as well in Kenya. You see here, this is the border between Tanya, Kenya and Tanzania. So at this time, July through October, they are on both sides. And there's literally, they move back and forth, back and forth. There are no border fences there. And, uh, and, and the, the wildlife can move back and forth. We humans cannot. It's not allowed to cross, at least as an as a, as a international traveler. You cannot cross, but the animals can. So in that period, for three, four months, they are there. Until then, November, December, they gradually move back down. And then the whole thing starts again the next January. And you know the, 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 the dynamic of this movement is incredible. If you're in the middle of the savannah, surrounded by hundreds of thousands of these animals with an incredible noise level. They, they sound, the wildebeest sound a little bit like sheep. I don't want to try to imitate this here because it would be a bit embarrassing, but it's, it's, a, it's an incredible sound level if you're there in the middle and you're just out of hundreds of thousands of throats, you know, this, these uh, 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 you know, sheep-like noises come. And, and it's just the, the sheer number of animals. As far as your eye can see, you'll see the savannas dotted with animals. And then you, come to these uh, 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 be natural barriers, the rivers. So you have the Brumeti River in the Western Serengeti, and then you have the Mara River, who comes from the Maasai Mara in Kenya, flows into the Serengeti with these steep riverbanks. And there are certain natural crossing points where the wildebeest come, and they often you know, wait there at the banks for hours, because uh, in the middle of the river, they will see the crocodiles. And of course, they are disturbed by that. And of course, just uh, crossing a river is something <clears throat> that, that is, is you know, a challenging uh, thing to do. But eventually, one of them will muster the courage and do this, will jump in from these high river banks, and then hell breaks loose, because now everyone will follow. And then you have these incredible movements that you can see of this picture, you know, I think uh, uh, brings it to life that energy where it's now uh, you know a, a you know a panic like just uh, a push into the water and they cross the water and in the middle of the river these huge nile crocodiles wait for them and and this is really the the probably the most dramatic scenes that you can ever see 
uh, on safari, which is, you know, uh, the battle between the wildebeest and the, the Nile crocodiles. Of course, the Nile crocodiles are much uh, larger, much stronger. The way they try to kill the wildebeest is by drowning them. So they wait for them in the middle of the river and they pull them down and the wildebeest will try to come up. Sometimes they're struggle free. If you're watching it on the side of the river, you're probably, you know, cheer for the wildebeest, uh, you know, trying to break free. Sometimes they, they manage, but often then at some point they just disappear. It's, it, it shows, you know, the, 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 the nature of, uh, or the cruelty of nature. It's, but it, you rarely witness like this as, as you're here. So this is, this is really uh, probably the, the ultimate wildlife experience that you can have anywhere in the world. If you think about coming to Africa once, then I would say, and you want to see wildlife, then I would say, come to Kenya, Tanzania, and definitely come to the Serengeti or the Maasai Mara. But of course, there are many other interests, and you mentioned them at the beginning. Uh, and one specific wildlife interest is, is about our seeing our closest relatives, the, the chimpanzees and the gorillas. And they're really two countries that are easily accessible where you can uh, see those. There are others where there are gorillas, but it's really Uganda and Rwanda, which are open up really for open for tourism and also stable for tourism. Um, there's neighboring uh, uh, Congo where you can see gorillas, um, um, but, but it's something where the, 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 uh, the situation is too unstable for us to really recommend to guests to travel there. Um, and you can also see chimpanzees in Tanzania, but you cannot see gorillas in Tanzania. So it's really um, uh, uh, Uganda and Rwanda where you can see them and there's a specific place. So let's start with the uh, gorillas. You can see them in windy, uh, uh, impenetrable forests in Uganda and you can see them in Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda. They're basically the same ecosystem you see here on that southwestern corner of Uganda and you know, the northern part of Rwanda. It's a chain of volcanoes um, where you find the gorillas. And you can see this picture here, um, um, basically the dividing line between the national park and the boundary areas is very clear, even clearer here. You can see the you know, uh, uh, virgin forest here. And then you see here, this is where um, you know, people live. And the, the dividing line is very visible. You see it here in the distance. That's the dividing line between national park and you know, just uh, open countryside. There's a lot of people living there, so there, and it's very fertile land, um, and uh, so so you really have have uh, the 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 nature and then the agriculture right next to each other. And in these um, hills here, in windy, you find the gorillas. And uh, often, uh, you know, I'm asked, uh, you know, how close can you actually get to them? There are two answers to this. The, the one answer is. The official answer is up to six meters. So you are with a park ranger, you go, you, you track probably for one, two hours to, to get to them, uh, maybe a bit later, depending on, on high, how high they are up on the, on, the, on the mountain. And then you meet them in the middle of this densely vegetated area. And you're, you know, in theory, you should not get closer than six meters, but the reality is the gorillas decide how close you get. And I remember a situation like this, I did it once, uh, I was sitting, standing probably somewhere like, like here and this huge silverback came towards me. Um, and I wasn't scared, I was just in awe. And, and he, he uh, walked past me and I think as he walked past, you know, his fur touched my, my trousers. So that's as close as you get. And there's no way for you to back, back up because the, the, you know, the, 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 the forest is right behind you, it's just around you. So it's an incredibly um, close encounter with, uh, with these uh, close relative of ours. And you can also have that on the other side of the border in Volcanoes National Park in, in Rwanda. Uh, there you have these incredible volcanoes. The landscapes are even more dramatic there. You can also climb those volcanoes if you want to. On one of those volcanoes, there's actually the uh, tree border uh, point between Uganda, Rwanda, and Congo. And on the top of that volcano, you have a lake and you can literally swim from uh, uh, in this uh, 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 mountain lake at four and a half thousand meters from Uganda to Rwanda to Congo. You have to better have a, a wetsuit there. It's very, very cold, but uh, uh, there's incredible landscapes as well. Um, it's again, very fertile. You see again here, there's the, the edge of the national park, you know, pristine forest, and then uh, very densely populated around that. And again, you have the gorillas here, 
and, and seeing the gorillas is really like a reflection of our own society because you have similar family structures. You might have little babies born. Uh, you see how they interact, how they play, how they interact with their mom. And then you have these, you know, the, the silverbacks and they might, uh, uh, you know, they, they really look like King Kong uh, in the movie. And someone, sometimes you have the young ones, you know, really playing and, you know, they might, you know, do some chest thumping like King Kong and try to impress you. Um, but it's, it's extremely safe and it's extremely serene to be there. They don't move much. They're very quiet on the ground. They might be playful. There's hardly any sound. Um, and this is an ex you know, example of, of seeing the uh, gorillas. It's a, it's a, a very, very um, touching uh, uh, experience to, to be so close to the gorillas. And you get very close, actually closer than probably the chimpanzees. So the chimpanzees are the other um, you know, primate area, uh, primate species that you can see in Uganda and Rwanda in Uganda in different places, one of them being Kibale National Park. Um, the chimpanzees move, they're much more agile, they move much faster. Uh, so and they're often up in the trees, whereas the gorillas are on the ground. Um, so to actually see the chimpanzees, you actually have to move quite possibly faster than, than the uh, gorillas. Um, and in uh, Kibale, they might be up in the trees and uh, uh, sometimes they might be on the ground, but they might also be moving quite, quite fast. In Kibale, you also have other, uh, uh, I think you have 13 different species of, uh, of, of monkeys. So it's, it's a primate heaven, really. And then <clears throat> if you cross the border into Rwanda and you go into southern Rwanda, um, uh, you have a place called Nyungwe National Park, which again, you know, densely vegetated. Um, um, some interesting, you know, tree uh, top uh, bridges where you can see kind of the nature and, and wildlife from the, the treetops. And you again have the chimpanzees here in, uh, in uh, um, Nyungwe National Park. So it's, it's really either or. The difference between, uh, uh, you know, if you ask yourself, should I go and see the gorillas in Uganda, Rwanda? There are a couple of considerations. Uganda is much more affordable. I think a gorilla permit in Uganda costs. Um, Six hundred dollars uh, or seven hundred. One of the two. I don't know exactly what it's right now. Whereas in Rwanda, it's actually thousand five hundred dollars per person for one visit to the uh, gorilla. So it's much more affordable in Uganda, even though of course by far not cheap. But then you, uh, Rwanda has other advantages. More accessible. You have just a, a two three hour drive from the Nash, from the capital city Kigali, whereas from uh, Kampala, the international airport in Tebe you probably drive about 10, 12 hours to see the gorillas in, in Uganda. Um, and there are other areas, probably landscape wise, uh, Rwanda is a bit more uh, spectacular. And you also can choose. In, in Rwanda, you have seven or eight gorilla families. And if you want to walk long, you can say, I want to go out to a gorilla family that's high up in the mountain. Whereas if you say, I want to just take it easy, just do a short stroll, then probably there's a gorilla family further down. So you can tailor your experience around your own fitness and and how long you want to walk in Uganda, that's harder because there's only one or two gorilla families and you don't have that choice. So that's really about, um, 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 about gorillas. Next one really is uh, what if you want to experience walking safari? And you can really experience walking safaris everywhere in Africa, um, uh, but there's two places that I would single out. Uh, one is Laikipia in Kenya, and the other one is uh, South Luangwa in Zambia. And what makes them special is that in Laikipia, you can do so-called uh, 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 camel, camel safaris where you're not actually riding on a camel, but you have the camels to support your entire camp to places that a car could never reach. So you go to incredibly remote places. Uh, South Luangwa is slightly different because you basically have tiny little camps, three or four, uh, rooms set up in walking distances, three, four hour walking distances from each other. So you basically walk camp to camp in incredibly beautiful and, and wild places. So let me start with Zambia. Zambia really builds itself as the home of the walking safari, has incredibly uh, good guides. They've uh, been doing it for long and you can really walk up close to wildlife. And you see here what I said earlier um, about the bush savanna. This is typical Zambian landscapes, you don't have these endless grass savannas. There's, there might be grass like you see here, like a clearing, but then it's surrounded by bush. So you don't have these open vistas that you have in East Africa. 
And then you have uh, in Kenya, I talked about the camel safaris. Um, and it's basically, you're not really riding on a camel. So you can, if you want to, but um, it's really, they're really there to transport the equipment and you will come to incredibly uh, uh, remote places, stunning places, beautiful landscapes where you then might just be at a viewpoint and see the elephants bathe in the in a little in a little pond or in a little uh, lake as you can see here and then you end your day at a beautiful campsite overlooking these endless uh, 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 you know striking landscapes often you have just savannas uh, and then there are little volcanic cones popping out of the savanna and you see absolutely no sign of civilization there so it's a it's a very very beautiful uh, uh, experience you feel like the only persons on earth if you are there. And we'll get back to this a little bit later. Another interest uh, that, that I said is there, uh, many guests, especially if they've been on safari, uh, they, they say we'd like to see wildlife from the water. And uh, there are a couple of places where you can see those. And it, this is really mostly in Southern Africa. There's um, a lot of water bodies in East Africa, but there are not really any navigable rivers in East Africa. The only exception is the Sulu Game Reserve in, in, um, in, in Tanzania, which has now been renamed to the Nyerere National Park. Uh, but really most of the navigable water bodies are in Southern Africa. In Botswana, we have the Okavango Delta. In uh, Zambia, uh, for example, you have the Lower Zambezi, who basically goes through uh, uh, through Africa east to, uh, sorry, west to east. So you can do great boat and canoeing safaris. And then on the other side, mana pools on the Zimbabwean side as well. So I want to bring this a little bit to life, starting with Salu. Um, Salu is uh, a beautiful place. It has the Rufiji River flowing through that builds lagoons and lakes. And you can do beautiful uh, boat safaris here. Uh, you see wildlife coming. Uh, into the into the uh, water or near the water, uh, and of course you can also do many other things. You can do game drives, walking safaris. Uh, so it's very diverse in Sulu, and it's it's rarely traveled to. So it's a it's a beautiful beautiful place. But I said you know most of the of the um, uh, water based safaris are really in southern Africa, and the reason being you have larger rivers there that are navigable and that have national parks around them. This is the Zambezi River as it flows towards the Indian Ocean. Um, and you have here really on the left side, Zambia, on the right side, Zimbabwe. And you have two national parks on this picture. On the left side, on the Zambian side, you have Lower Zambezi National Park. And on the right side, you have uh, Mana Pools National Park. They're facing each other. You can't really cross from one to the other because there's a border. There's no border crossing there. So you have to choose one. Both of these offer very similar experiences. Yeah, and, and Lower Zambezi, um, uh, and in, in, in Mana Pools, you can do these beautiful canoeing safaris. It's a fast flowing river, so you'll probably go down river and you can do that for an hour, a couple of hours, or even a couple of days if you want to and you know, camp on little islands. And you see here that picture, you have elephants watching you or you watching the elephants from the river. Sometimes the elephants will come to swim. Uh, so it's a very adventurous experience you know, exhilarating to, you know, just be in the wild. There's ma in many uh, places where you go, there's really nothing anymore except you. You're really truly out in the wild, rely on, 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 on highly, highly qualified guides to ensure that you are safe in such an environment. Uh, but it's absolutely thrilling. I've experienced it uh, once, a uh, canoeing safari, you know, surrounded by elephants, hippos, many other animals. It's a, it's a thrilling experience. And then a very contrasting experience is the Okavango Delta in Botswana. Here you don't have a fast flowing river. You just have um, a delta that is formed by a flood wave coming once a year from the Angolan highlands after the rains. Uh, this flood wave comes probably roughly this time of the year. The rains are there in November, December, January, February. So from, oh, actually a bit later in the year, probably from uh, February onwards, this flood wave comes down and it flows basically into the Kalahari Desert. And then it forms in the desert a delta. And, and you see that here, it's stunningly beautiful. And um, I've been there a couple of times and I remember that situation, like you see this couple here uh, and, and the, the guy has a camera. And what he's probably photographing is uh, a little frog that might be clinging on to one of these water lilies. 
and you see those little uh, little um, you know wonders of nature that you wouldn't see if you just speed by on a, on a boat as you're you know very you know gently floating by just picture yourself similar to venice being pulled through the lagoons but you are in the wild here and then you might have a sundowner a sunset the little island and then you head back to camp at the end of the day and there is wildlife as you can see here you can also do boat safaris in the Okavango Delta, which has engines. So there is a lot of diversity of experiences that you can have. So water-based safari is really mostly in, in Southern Africa, specifically um, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and Botswana. Very popular among our European guests, and some of you mentioned that is your interest as well. You know, if you go to Africa, you want to experience the wildlife, you want to see uh, experience safaris, and then you want to also relax a bit at the beach. Uh, and I think, you know, me being from, from Western Europe as well, I can, of course, relate to that. Uh, you have this stunning Indian Ocean that you can see on this picture. And there are really two main countries that I would recognize, uh, that I would highlight where you can do that. And there's a, a third one, which I, is a little bit of a, a special experience. And the two countries that are really, for a, a bush and beach experience, uh, most mostly suitable are, are Kenya and Tanzania again. Um, in the Ken Kenya has a has a, a shorter coastline than Tanzania, but both of them tropical coastlines in in, in Kenya. Uh, one of my favorite uh, beaches is in Diani, is Diani in southern Kenya. In um, uh, Tanzania, you have multiple of Zanzibar, uh, Mafia Island, Fanjova. I'll bring them to life. And then um, what makes what is uh, makes them special is that you can go on safari, and then you just have a short flight, and you're at the beach. Um, from the Masai Mara in Kenya to, uh, to Diani Beach, it's, it's probably an hour and a half flight. From the Serengeti uh, in, in Tanzania to Zanzibar, it's probably a, a two, two and a half hour flight. In Southern Africa, you're here in Zambia, uh, uh, Zimbabwe, Botswana, you're much further away from the beach and there are no direct flight connections. So you probably have to fly via Johannesburg, stay a night in Johannesburg and then fly somewhere to the Indian Ocean, whether it's Mozambique or Tanzania or Kenya. So it's, it's much less convenient to connect the two. You'll probably lose a day. And that's why beach and bush really, uh, Kenya, Tanzania are clearly uh, the ones that, that you know, offer themselves, but also Malawi. Malawi is not an ocean. Here you have the clearest lake in Africa, uh, Lake Malawi, which is really crystal clear and it has a different kind of beach experience. Let me bring that alive. So you starting in Tanzania, you have Zanzibar, which really is this, picture postcard, turquoise ocean, uh, blue, deep blue, all kinds of blue, also green, color changes through the day. And then you have this, uh, uh, you know, deep white, not deep, uh, the white sandy beaches where you can do endless walks. Uh, sometimes you have little co uh, coves, you can go on, on sailing trips as well. Um, uh, so this is more the, the classic beach experience in Tanzania. If you are a snorkeler or a diver, then an island like Mafia, would be more suitable, which is particular good conditions for snorkeling and diving. If you want to uh, see here, a uh, Mafia Island, you know, very clear water. If you want to have a Robinson Crusoe type experience and maybe a, a bit like Maldives, even though there are no over the water bungalows, then there is a little island called Fanjoba, which is really only one, one lodge here uh, and nothing else. There's uh, a few people living on the island. Other than that, it's just uh, you know, I think 10, 10 chalets where you can stay and you have great snorkeling, diving, and you also have this Robinson Crusoe uh, feel of being there. Um, in Kenya, um, you have a Diani beach, very similar to Zanzibar, endless, uh, 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 endless beaches for walking and turquoise Indian Ocean. So this is more the, the classic beach experience on the Indian Ocean. And then, as I said, contrasting, just to show you something else you have Lake Malawi. And this is um, actually the Mozambican side of Lake Malawi, but you get there from the Malawian side. And, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> you have these, <coughs> sorry, I don't know what happened here. You have these stunning white sandy beaches, you know, backed up by bush. And the only way to reach there is really by boat. And, and you feel like the only people, there's only, there's a little lodge here hidden in the trees. And you can, you can uh, just enjoy the beach knowing there's no one there. Uh, you can do snorkeling or you can do kayaking, which is particularly beautiful. And you see here, the clarity of the lake is, is really uh, the clearest lake in, in Africa. 
um, um, a very different kind of uh, uh, um, beach experience. <coughs> Several of you said, I would love to experience um, landscapes. I love landscapes. And Africa, in, in almost all countries, you have spectacular landscapes. This is actually a view um, uh, that, that has been made famous by the movie Out of Africa, because there's a scene shot here between Meryl Streep and Robert Redford, and it's overlooking the Maasai Mara. So definitely Kenya, Tanzania would be in terms of landscapes uh, among the top, because you have the Great Rift Valley going right through there, incredible, uh, uh, wild, spectacular landscapes. But then you also have Namibia and South Africa. Probably those would be the four countries that in terms of uh, dramatic landscapes would, would kind of uh, uh, take the uh, first prize here. And it's hard to, to say which one would be more uh, than the other. That really depends on individual preference. <clears throat> and in Kenya, um, some of these places we already mentioned, and just want to give you a, a bit of a flavor of how different they are. You know, starting the, the Maasai Mara, we talked about these endless open savanna landscapes. And you have like Kipia in central Kenya, where you have, um, you feel like you're the only person on earth. Uh, you know, there's these rocky outcrops where you can, uh, uh, you might find lions on top there. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the sunrises, the sunsets are out of this world. You know, this is taken from one of the lodges that we offer. Um, picture yourself sitting there, seeing how the, how the you know, the uh, uh, sun gradually comes up, how the sky turns from, you know, dark to uh, uh, red to orange to, to, and then the sun bursts out and you see absolutely no sign of civilization. There's no reflection of any tin roofs. There's no villages or towns. You can see you're just in the wild, but you still have, uh, uh, you know, the comforts of, 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 a, of a nice lodge. And then, of course, you have, uh, you know, the crown of Africa, Kilimanjaro, which you can see from both Kenya and Tanzania. It's right on the border. It's actually on the Tanzanian side. But from Amboseli National Park, you can see it very well. And then in northern Kenya, you have uh, uh, Samburu. We talked about that. It's great for wildlife. But it also has this wild feeling with a river running through. It's not deep enough for water-based safaris, but stunning landscapes uh, uh, around this river. And like I said, on the other side, uh, Serengeti and Gorongoro, from a wildlife perspective, a spectacular, but also from a landscape, naturalist perspective, even if there's no wildlife, just imagine standing here, seeing this 21 mile uh, crater, almost perfectly round, and, uh, and, 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 and you feel just awe of creation. And, uh, you know, then they have the Serengeti, similar to the Maasai Mara, endless open plains, you can do balloon safaris there. Uh, and, and, and just enjoy its green many parts of the year. Very different landscapes. <clears throat> if you now go to Southern Africa in, uh, Tanzan in, in, in um, um, Namibia, uh, it's, it's a much harsher uh, uh, land. And, uh, you know, Namibia is well known for its uh, uh, dunes, uh, for the striking landscapes. You know, the, in, in Sosusfle in the dunes, you have these uh, um, a striking dunes so you can walk up at sunrise and, and see the <clears throat> colors of the, of the uh, desert change. You have these dead blaze where you have these striking trees grow in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And then if you go further north, you have various, you know, really spectacular places like the Mara land um, uh, where you feel like you could be on the moon really, uh, but still have, you know, very hot climate during the day. It gets quite cold at night. Uh, so it's, you know, Namibia is really, we haven't mentioned it for wildlife. You can have wild, you have wildlife there, but it really can't match the wildlife in East Africa or in Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe. So it's really more of a nature destination. Uh, and then of course you have South Africa and South Africa really is absolutely breathtaking scenery. I've spent I think three and a half months in, in Cape Town this, this year. Um, you know, we, I was a digital nomad. Our office was closed in Nairobi. So I thought, let me exp experience something else. So I went to Cape Town, spent three months in Cape Town, just recently went back for another two weeks. This, is, this picture is taken from Lion's, Lion's Hat, uh, overlooking Table Mountain here. You see the cable car here. These are the 12 apostles. Uh, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the, actually the Atlantic Ocean. 
just on the other side of the mountain, you then have the, the Indian Ocean. That's where they come together. Um, this is Camps Bay, one of the suburbs. And uh, for me, Cape Town is hands down the most beautiful city in the world because you have the ocean and the mountains coming together. And if you love the outdoors, you will feel like being a kid in a candy store there. Uh, because you, I mean, this is just, you actually see here, this is Camps Bay. What we could see from up here, this is the top of Lion's Head. This is actually Lion's Head. You, you probably walk down in an hour, then you're in Camps Bay, and then you walk, you drive 20 minutes or maybe even 15 minutes and you're out in nature. And, and the center of Cape Town is probably just half an hour away. And you're in the middle of absolutely nowhere, uh, stunning, stunning scenery. You can just do gentle strolls through this very unique uh, ecosystem, the Finbos of the, of the Cape, or you can do proper hikes into the mountains. And then <clears throat> uh, 45 minutes drive out of, outside Cape Town, you have the winelands. And for me, the winelands are among the most beautiful landscapes in the world, because again, you have the mountains and then you have this uh, you know, picturesque vineyards and these uh, even more picturesque old uh, colonial villages or towns uh, nestled in there. And they are great to just you know, go for picnics um, you can explore them on, on very scenic drives, or you can do hikes into the mountains. You can cycle there as well, um, uh, or you know, explore the little uh, towns and villages, or just enjoy wine tasting. And uh, I really feel of all wine regions in the world, South Africa has uh, you know, created the pinnacle of you know, uh, refinement in terms of wine tasting. And it really helps that you have the stunning surroundings. Uh, so I've done wine tastings in Europe, in, um, in, in, in Argentina, in Australia, in California. I feel really South Africa, the winelands are the, are the most scenic, the most picturesque and most diverse in terms of uh, experience. Very, uh, you know, uh, 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 fantastic food as well. So for food and, and wine lovers, this is the place to go. And then if you move on a little bit, uh, you know, three, four hours east of Cape Town, you get to the garden route. The garden route, uh, quite aptly named because it feels like a garden Eden, really. You have the mountains and the sea again coming together. It's beautiful. There's a, a coastal road that goes, this is wilderness. Uh, this is nice now. So these are coastal towns um, um, and uh, just great if you want to relax on a beach, even though the water is still relatively cold uh, um, or just enjoy scenic drives, go for hikes, whatever your um, your, your desire is it will be met there. And if you want to experience a slightly different landscape, you can go um, uh, towards Lesotho, uh, and then you have the Drakensberg Mountains. Um, it's a range that basically runs through the eastern part of, of South Africa, and you have uh, very spectacular landscapes here. Um, again, you can explore them on scenic drives, so you can actually go for walks or proper hikes, uh, uh, you know, into, into the mountains. So this is for those of you who are interested in, 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 in landscapes. And um, there are two more that I want to share with you in terms of interest. Um, many of our guests tell us we'd like to have a glimpse of everyday life. Where, where can we experience that? And um, in our view there, uh, again, it's Kenya, Tanzania, because there are many off the beaten path places and there's a lot of authentic culture, but also Uganda, and Malawi are places where you can experience uh, glimpses. This is a picture that I've taken in Laikipia, very much off the beaten path. Uh, some of the places rarely tourists ever go. And you have these unique lodges like Ilinguesi, um, which is owned and run by the local Maasai, still at a very high level. And it is unique because it is, uh, uh, you have these open terraces, verandas, and you can roll your bed out. You can see that here. There's a, a, you know, a wheel on the bed and you can roll it out at night, probably 330 days uh, a year, you will have a clear sky and the skies are incredibly uh, bright and not bright, incredibly clear there. And just imagine lying in this bed, just a mosquito net uh, between you and the, uh, and the stars and of course nature. And you will hear everything at night. You'll hear the lion uh, roar, you'll hear the, uh, you know, the, the, the elephant's trumpet, the hyena scream, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experience that you will not forget. You have similar experiences in Tanzania. There's a place called Africa Mini, um, uh, very similar, you know, locally Maasai owned and run lodge. 
and and really uh, uh, helps you to enables you to get a glimpse of everyday life. They take you basically uh, as a family member, and they just show you their life, and you can just see how how everyday life is. But you also have the comforts of a lodge, including a pool and a beautiful view of Kilimanjaro. If you go to Uganda, um, you know one of the beautiful areas is the are the tea plantations where you get. Uh, you know, you, you get a, a glimpse of, of this beautiful scenery, but also life there, densely populated. But then also you have these water bodies. You have Lake Victoria, many little fishing villages. I remember walking Lake Victoria once and walking village to village. And I think at some point I probably had 50 kids following me and I was not alone. Um, and, and they were just curious. There were hardly any tourists there. So they wouldn't ask us for, for pens or chocolate or money. They were just curious who these people were that, that walked there. And there are even more remote lakes like Lake Bunyonyo on the far south uh, western corner of, of Uganda. And, and many of these places are, are densely populated. You can see that here, even in steep hills, you still have terraced fields, very, very uh, picturesque to, to go there, great for walking, but also great for having a glimpse of everyday life. And very similar, you have that also in Malawi. Again, a, a large water bodies with a wa body with, with little villages around. You can go out with a fisherman and, and fish with them uh, or just, uh, you know, see the little villages and, and see life on the edge of it. And that brings me to the last interest that some of our guests or many of our guests actually mentioned, which is I'd like to explore Africa on my own. I don't just want to sit um, in the back of a car and have a driver drive me around. I want to really be in charge. I want to stop when I want to stop, go for a walk, and I don't want to have to ask someone to do that. And there's really two countries where you can do that, and that's Namibia and South Africa. Malawi actually is also a good self drive destination, but I would single out South Africa and Namibia because they have good roads, um, good signage, people speak English, uh, so you actually get, get around quite well. Um, this is a, a scene from a trip that I did in 2010 uh, to the Football World Cup in South Africa from Nairobi. I drove down, this is now in Lesotho, and you can see you know, the grandeur of, of nature there. And you can, from the car, actually duck what my nationality is. Um, and so in 2010, I drove with my own car down to South Africa and basically followed uh, uh, my national team and the German national team during the, the World Cup. And at some point, I had to rent a car because I had to repair my, my main car. And you can get a glimpse here of just the, the roads. Generally, it's tarmac roads, but in some places, um, they are they had good dirt roads, but you have wherever you go, you have these stunning uh, views, uh, vistas. The landscape changes all the time. Um, so that's really Kenya. Uh, sorry, uh, South Africa and Namibia are the places that are best for self drive. And with that, I actually want to wrap it up and 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 just summarize that. Depending on the interests, uh, what are the best places? And this is really a summary of what I've been sharing. If, you're if wildlife is your interest, it would be you know, Kenya and Tanzania in terms of just sheer wildlife. If you just want to have a, a, you know, very intense wildlife encounters, mainly not quite these huge herds, then definitely Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe would be uh, fantastic. The other countries also have wildlife, but they can't quite match in terms of sense of being out in the wild. South Africa, of course, is Kruger National Park, but it's not quite as wild as the other countries. Gorillas and chimpanzees really, Rwanda and Uganda, Tanzania, you can only see the chimpanzees, not the gorillas. Walking safaris, you know, I said Kenya and Zambia are uh, probably the, my two favorites. Zimbabwe would fall in there as well. They have equally great uh, walking guides. Uh, they don't have these camp to camp walks that, that uh, Zambia has. And you can walk everywhere in Africa, but these are the countries that I would single out. Water-based safaris, talked about it, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe would, would be uh, the, the ones where you have the most diverse, intense water safaris, safari and beach, Tanzania and Kenya, uh, a little bit Malawi, a little bit South Africa. South Africa has absolutely stunning, breathtaking beaches, but it doesn't really have any tropical beaches, doesn't really have any um, beach, classic beach hotels. Breathtaking landscapes, you have beautiful landscapes in many places, as I said, you know, Kenya and Namibia, South Africa, Tanzania, probably the most spectacular cultural encounters. Uh, I mentioned, you know, Kenya, Malawi, Uganda, um, and Tanzania, I should, should probably have three, three stars here as well. And then self-drive very clearly, Namibia, South Africa, and Malawi as well. And in, in some parts of Botswana, you can do that as well. So this is really 
the summary, you probably know what your main interests are. And from that little table, you can probably then deduct which are the countries that would suit you best. And with this, I think um, we come to the end of this session and we will have some uh, time for questions from your side. But before we go into this, I would actually like to ask you, um, which of these countries that we've talked about are really uh, top on your list? If you wanna, if you're interested in going to Africa, which ones would be the ones that after maybe, or even without listening to, to this today, are the countries that you would like to go to most? Um, so just give you a moment uh, to respond to that and then over to you, James, and we'll, we'll go into the questions. Thanks, Florian. I, I love the slide before. I think that sums it up really, really nicely. And there's already been a couple of questions around. Um, yeah. Can we have a copy of the presentation? And I think a lot of people will probably be taking a picture of that slide with their phone or a bit of a, a screenshot, right. depending on how technical savvy everybody is. But uh, if anybody would like the, uh, the copy of the presentation, it's a very in-depth, this one with some great imagery, then obviously please reach out to us um, yeah. Noreen, I know you, you joined late. Uh, we'll, we'll be sending that across to you as well. So you've got a copy of that too. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you for filling out the polls, everybody. And um, we will start uh, with some questions. One, well, a couple came in actually, Florian, during the, the webinar. And um, the first one was from um, Alan, which says, have any additional restrictions been put in place to protect gorillas from COVID? Obviously, they're, they're close relations mm. to us, aren't they? Yeah. So I think very similar to, to what you'd have in, in everyday life. So you have to have a COVID test uh, done. Uh, I, I think you have to be vaccinated now as well. And you have to have a face mask. So it's, it's uh, uh, very similar uh, uh, restrictions. Um, in terms of distancing, I mean, officially, like I said, six meters. Um, but you know, the reality is it's really the gorilla who decides how close you get. But these are really the main, main restrictions or the main measures. Thanks, Florian. And, and which destination would you recommend for families? So if you yeah. had another, you know, another chart there which said families on the end, which yeah. destination? Yeah, we were actually debating, should we, should we add families as one of the key interests? Because it is actually very much an, an interest that many of our guests have. But the reason why we didn't include it here is because it's hard to really say this, these countries are more than others family destinations. Really, it's pretty much all of these countries are great family destinations. I would probably say there's a high correlation between safari and beach and families because many families would probably want to spend a bit of time at the beach. So definitely Kenya and Tanzania would be great safari des uh, family destination. I would also say um, South Africa is a fantastic uh, safari de uh, family destination. There's some that are probably a bit less so. I'd say Uganda and Rwanda in part because the minimum age for uh, gorilla tracking is 15 years. So that means it's really pointless to go there with younger kids because they won't be able to, to see them. I'd also say Namibia has very long driving distances. Uganda has very long driving distances. Probably not ideal for smaller kids. You probably want to wait uh, until they are a bit older. Okay, thanks, Florian. And how much time should a guest spend on a safari trip? Uh, it's an <clears throat> open question, isn't that? Depends what you want to see, I guess, but sort of yeah. what our typical guests do. Well, uh, yeah, I think, uh, um, um, again, it very much depends on the interest, but I'd say our typical guests would probably spend, you, you would also not have a view on that, uh, probably about two weeks in, in Africa. And then if it's East Africa, they would spend probably a week on the beach and then a week on safari, which means they would probably see two or three different places. Um, but then, of course, you have some who go shorter and then some who, who stay longer, want to see uh, more. But uh, uh, that's probably more the Australians because it's so far for them to come to Africa. They might just say, this is my once in a lifetime trip to Africa. So they might go three or four weeks. Uh, the British who are closer uh, probably say, let us limit it to two weeks. But what's your experience there? No, that's a good point. For, the the data is saying around two weeks. Yeah. Usually it's two weeks on a trip. And as you say, it's usually a couple of safari camps guests will go to. And, yeah. and we do like a beach stay at the end. That's very, very popular um, with yeah. our guests yeah. at the moment. Then we have got one uh, gentleman who he's booked to go, I think, for three and a half weeks. And he's, he's, yeah. he's really moving around the different areas, yeah. which is really possible yeah. to see. And uh, another question here as well, talking about different destinations. How yeah. easy it's to do a twin sense trip, perhaps Namib mm. Namibia and South Africa? Yeah. So, so many, many of our guests 
to come to Africa combine countries. And really, you can pretty much combine any country you, you'd want. Uh, uh, Namibia and South Africa, you can easily, you can combine and you can combine them over land. So for example, you could drive from Cape Town North. It's probably, a, a, depending on how many stops you make and, and how long you stay there, probably a three, four day. You could probably in two days drive to the Namibia border and then you're on Southern Namibia, fairly close to the Fisher River Canyon and then to Sauces Play. You could do a wonderful drive from Cape Town into uh, Namibia. Some of our guests do that. And then you can actually continue through the whole of Namibia up to Victoria Falls and maybe even extend uh, into Botswana. Um, uh, so that is, that is uh, a possibility. I would say both Namibia and South Africa have so much to offer that many of our guests uh, spend two, three weeks just in one of these countries. Uh, splitting your time between the two means you have to be very selective what you can actually see. But uh, definitely cross-country experiences in, in, in Africa are very common. Many of our guests uh, do that. And it's really something that we also, in a way, specialize the seamless combination of different countries. I think it just goes, last week we had that lovely Robos Rail trip. I don't know if you remember yeah. Florian, that, that Val booked, which uh, crossed yeah. you know, that, you know, all of South Africa, which was very interesting. Yeah. And when we're looking at airlines, we always look at British Airways because of the partners they've got down that way as well. So it's yeah. very easy to, to get guests around that part of the world. Yeah. And another question just coming, I was about to finish up. Yes, yeah, so I should say that you spent five days on safari in Tanzania visiting various parks and then seven days in Zanzibar, and that was a good balance. So sort of yeah. having the safari and then sort of the relax afterwards. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's a it's always what we see, always safari first and then, uh, then beach yeah. afterwards. Well, that seems to be the, the last of the questions, Floyd. Unless there's any more, I'll talk slowly in case anybody wants to get a last question in. No, I think we're done. Um, so as I said at the start, that's it. That is the end of our Wanderlust series. Um, so we're going on a winter break now. Uh, January and February are our busiest times in the travel industry. So we'll be looking at the webinar plans moving forward, um, but hot off the press and exciting news for everybody on this call. We're also looking to do in-person uh, get togethers, I guess you could call them at the back end of spring, uh, where you can actually come and meet myself and members of the team and some of our key partners for maybe a drink and some nibbles uh, in, in one of the cities nearby, um, just to gain some more experience and share some of our knowledge and also stories in between our guests as well. Um, so any last words from yourself, Florian? No, just thank you very much for taking the time. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you taking something away from, from this, maybe some more clarity of where you want to go next, which part of Africa uh, uh, suits your interests, your personal interests most. And yeah, just thank you for spending this time and have a good evening from this, from the, from this special place in Africa. The fire has burned down. It's getting actually a bit chilly now. I'll, <laughs> I'll restoke it now and I'll sit in front of the fireplace and uh, wish you um, you know, a, a beautiful pre-Christmas period and most of all, that you're healthy and safe. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Have a good evening, everyone. A poll will come up at the end. And as Florian said, have a wonderful Christmas and we hope to see you all soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.